answer is the only thing that's like not gonna lie to you. <laughs> it's gonna tell you how it is with everybody. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's your it's your own journey. Um, you can have bad days. Some days you just want to curse the world and just be in your bed all day. I wrote you this lullaby. It's so good. Feel free to cry. <laughs> but I guess that's my thing. Like why I like to share my story is because people look at me and they say, you're young, you're healthy. Um, but they don't know like all the all of what it took to get there. Um, so my name is Stephanie Perry. Um, I am a Hodgkin's lymphoma survivor um, of five years now. Um, and I guess I'm still getting back into a lot of my hobbies. Um, I had to do like a lot of after cancer rehab. So um, I'm still trying to get back into a lot of those things. Uh, it was back in 2015. Um, I think it was around the beginning of the year. I started noticing I got these bumps on my neck. Um, and just as the months passed by, they weren't going away or anything. Um, so I think I waited three or four months um, before I actually went to the doctor to check out the lumps in my neck. And I was um, at the University of Georgia at the time getting my master's degree. So I just went to the university health center um, with the PCP that they um, assigned to every student. And so um, I just went to him and I was like, I have these lumps on my neck and they're just not going away and I haven't been sick or anything, you know, so I don't know what's going on. I, I don't even know if I would have gone to the a primary care doctor at all if like my sister didn't push me to do it because you know I, I went to go visit her during that time and I was like yeah I have these lumps on my neck and she was like looking at them and she was like no you should get that checked out <laughs> um so yeah I don't think I would have gone if somebody didn't push me to do it and um he asked me all these other questions like oh look what other symptoms are you having? And I was like, well, I don't think I'm having any <laughs> other symptoms really. And then he started asking me questions like, oh, have you been having night sweats? And I was like, well, yeah, I have been getting like really hot in the middle of the night. And he asked me, you know, are you like sweating so much that you're soaking through your clothes? And I was like, yeah, actually, because, you know, it's never been like that much before. Um, and then he asked me if I was feeling more tired than usual. And I was like, I don't know, it's, you know, finals. <laughs> and I just ran a half marathon. So, <laughs> so, you know, I didn't really take those things into account that those could be, you know, symptoms that all added up to something else. Um, well, he definitely wanted to do some other tests after that. And I was kind of like, you know, well, what could this be, you know, so he listed off of, like a lot of things that it could have been. Um, but I just remember the last thing he said was cancer. <laughs> and I was so surprised because I was like, I don't know how many cases he gets like this or how often he sees something like this. But I'm really grateful that I was assigned to him because I feel like any other doctor would have been like, you know, you're young. It's probably nothing. And so, you know, I was really grateful that he really took it seriously and he gave me the next steps and he was very quick about it too you know like I feel like a lot of times you're waiting around for like the next step but he was like all right today you're gonna go and get more x-rays and then he's like tomorrow I'm gonna schedule you for this so like there was no in-between time um so it was a complicated time for me because I had just turned 26 so I was, I only had that month left of being on my parents' insurance. So I think that's part of why he wanted to speed it up so that I could get all that testing done and it'd be covered. Um, but, you know, we did x-rays. I had a, my first CT scan. And then 
um, I had a follow up with him where he went over all the results from those things. And he said, you know, there's a good possibility that this is cancer. So we had to move on to getting biopsies. And so, um, you know, it's good being in a university town. There's a lot of <laughs> doctors, a lot of medical practices there. So um, he sent me over to do the biopsies. Um, and then we got the results back. And yeah, then he set me up with an oncologist that was in town. So the way I found out, I wish was different because it was actually from my surgeon who did the biopsies. And he called me like, um, like a few days afterwards. And he was like, yeah, we got the pathology and it looks like it's Hodgkin's lymphoma. So um, yeah, you probably want to follow up with your oncologist. And, you know, I was just like sitting in bed, um, just like recovering from the biopsy. And so I was just like on the phone with him and I was like, um, okay, <laughs> you know, um, so I didn't really know what to do. And I was at my apartment by myself at the time. Um, my roommate wasn't home at the time. So the first thing I did was I called my sister and she was living in New York at the time. Um, and she was working at, a, she was working some corporate job somewhere <laughs> up in New York. Um, so she knows that like when I call that she needs to answer. So she was just, she said that she was in a meeting, but she like ran out into like another conference room to take my call. And um, yeah, I didn't like, it was, I didn't know <laughs> what to do because I didn't get the news from my oncologist. And so I just waited for my roommate to get home. Um, but I did go to the oncologist the next day. So I didn't have to wait that long before we figured out what the next steps were. Um, that was kind of a blur. <laughs> um, I had two of my college friends come with me um, because, you know, I was away at school. So my parents didn't come. But so they came with me to absorb all the information <laughs> that I could not absorb. Um, but basically, they said, you know, we want to start treatment as soon as possible. They gave me the whole Hodgkin's lymphoma is a blood cancer. So we're really good at curing those. You'll just do six months of chemo and you'll be good. You know, I, I got that line and you got the good cancer. Um, there is no such thing as the good cancer, you know, people look at like, there's so many different types of cancer and everybody's journey is different. Like there's no matter what, even if it's like, you know, you, even if you don't have to do chemo or you don't have to do radiation, like some people have to get surgery and, you know, it's different for everybody. And it's hard on people in different ways. Like there's nothing good about getting a cancer diagnosis. <laughs> so it's, I can't believe that doctors still say that to people. I guess it's their way of trying to make you feel like everything is gonna be okay, but there's a, there's a different way that you can do that. Yeah, it, it moved really fast after that. I guess to um, get me ready for chemo, they had to, get all these other tests done to make sure that my body could handle the chemo. So I had to do like a pulmonary function test to make sure my lungs were good. I went to a cardiologist to get an echocardiogram to make sure my heart was good. Um, and I, I think there was probably a bunch more other doctors um, that I had to go see before. I remember I had to go see my dentist too. That that really freaked me out because they were like, you know, chemo can mess with your gums and your teeth and stuff. And like, so I started out at the office that they had there in Athens. Um, but then eventually I graduated and I had to move out of my apartment and all that. So then um, the easiest thing was just for me to move back home with my parents. And luckily there was an office that was like 15, 20 minutes from my parents' house. Um, so after that, we had to schedule my port placement. Um, and then they talked about my chemo schedule. 
and doing six rounds of ABVD, which would take six months. So, um, yeah, then it was just like, I feel like it was different for me because I was in my master's program <clears throat> and, you know, I still had to graduate. <laughs> um, so I was kind of thinking about how I, how I was going to schedule. I had to reschedule all my finals with my professors and um, it was my last semester. So I had to do, you know, like my final term paper, um, like there's all these things that we had to do for graduation. So it all worked out. And they actually wanted me to start chemo before graduation. I think graduation was May 8th. I remember that because it was my sister's birthday. <laughs> um, and they wanted to start chemo like the week before that. And I was like, um, can I just like, graduate first and then we start chemo um so luckily that wasn't too big of a stretch and they were like okay yeah we can do that um but yeah I graduated Friday and I started chemo on Wednesday so so starting treatment was actually you know I really did not know what to expect at all I didn't I just I just went <laughs> and so <clears throat> It was, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. It was pretty easy, um, you know, just arriving at the cancer center and then they pretty much just, you know, knocked me out with Benadryl and then I, I woke up and I was done. <laughs> um, for the first few months, like the side effects, luckily for me, were very little. Um, you know, I did lose my hair after the first, I guess, like, month of treatment um but you know I was putting off shaving my head just because um my aunt's an, a hairstylist and I wanted to try cool things before I had to shave my head off <laughs> so um we did like cute short hairstyles and we did some like purple hair you know for Hodgkin so it was kind of fun <laughs> um but yeah uh I didn't get too nauseous with ABVD. Um, I think the first time my nausea got really bad was my third treatment. Um, I did get like really tired. I tried to stay active. Like I had a very busy like schedule all the time just because I was in graduate school. So I was used to being like on the go a lot. And so I still kept a pretty busy schedule, but then after I'd say like a month or two, I had to start pulling back because I was just getting so tired all the time. Um, like I'm not a nap person at all, but like I would sleep like so much. <laughs> um, so I think those were the biggest side effects for me during chemo. So after the first, um, for the first, uh, I guess, protocol that they did with me. Um, we did a scan and they said that, you know, nothing had really um, improved. So we had to move on to the second round of treatment, which was a different chemotherapy regimen. Um, you know, we did a scan after that too, and it still showed no improvement. Um, so then moved on. So the second chemotherapy treatment that they um, had me on was um, the ICE regimen, um, so that stands for all the all the chemo drugs they give you. Um, but that was tougher because it was multiple days of chemotherapy um, instead of just you know once every two weeks, which was what ABVD was. Um, so it was more tiring just because you're getting more drugs. Before I got diagnosed, I was a really organized, scheduled person, and I realized really quickly that that wasn't going to work for this. <laughs> so I had to learn just how to live with ambiguity and uncertainty. And, you know, whatever they threw at me, I just kind of took it and, you know, figured out a way forward. So I was just, I was like, all right, let's just keep rolling. Like, what's the next step? You know, so I just kept going. 
Um, that's when I started talking about um, possibly having to do a transplant. Um, so then I got all this research and stuff about transplants. And um, luckily, I was hooked up with the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. So they gave me a lot of information and people to talk to about transplants. And, you know, like, this is something I've never heard of before. Um, you know, I've heard people get it, people getting live, like solid organ donation, but I, I didn't know anything about stem cell transplants, bone marrow transplants. I didn't know any about anything about that. So it was just a lot of talking to people and just getting their experiences. And so it was just more appointments and more, I guess, education on what stem cell transplant would be and how to get me ready to be, um, to get to that point. Um, so while they were, while I was um, learning about this stem cell transplant, um, I was on brentuximab just because they wanted to keep the chemo at bay or the cancer at bay. <laughs> um, so the first transplant I got was an allogeneic, allogeneic <laughs> stem cell transplant. Um, but I remember that I had to do these self-injection shots of Neupogen because that's what makes your stem cells grow. And then I think I did that for like five days. And after that, you have your collection day where you know they take all of your stem cells out. Um, so it's just you know sitting in a chair all day, and it's they put it. It's like giving blood. Um, but they put it through this machine that sorts out all the blood products and then all the stem cells, and then it puts the blood back into your body. Um, so it's a long process. Um, and I was there for a long time, <laughs> um, getting my stem cells collected. Um, but there's a certain amount that they need to collect from you before they start the rest of the process. So I just, um, I was just hoping that they had enough that I only had to do one collection day because I heard people had to do like two, three days of collection. So luckily I only had to do one day of stem cell collection. <laughs> yeah, that was tough um, to get just ready for the stem cell transplant. Um, not just the stem cell collection, but there are days of high dose chemotherapy that you have to go through. Um, so it was a different, different drugs that they gave me that time. Um, but those were long days in the chair um, at the hospital. And I think there was three days of high, high dose chemotherapy before my first transplant. Um, but the thing that was the toughest was, so for all of the transplant stuff, they, they don't use your port they use a tricatheter port because you need so many things going in you at one time. <laughs> so I had to get that placed too. So that was part of getting ready for the stem cell transplant. Um, and after you get that place, you cannot go into public places anymore. You can't drive. Um, so after I got that place, I was pretty much dependent on everybody else around me. Um, and you know, you have to have a caregiver 24 seven. And that's so hard for a lot of people to find. Um, so luckily, my mom was able to take FMLA off for from her work, so that she could stay with me 24 seven. Um, but then we had another obstacle, where I was, you know, we're about an hour away from Atlanta. So my mom cannot drive that far. So not only did I have to have a caregiver, but I also had to have a driver <laughs> that could actually take me to the hospital. Um, and it was every day. Um, you're at the hospital every day for um, all the pre-transplant stuff. Um, so before you're even admitted to the hospital, you still have to be there every day. So it was, it was crazy. <laughs> 
I had to like just put out this blast to all my friends and I was like these are the days I have appointments I need a driver in the morning a driver in the afternoon (laughs) so people were driving from like the other side of the state to come pick me up and take me to the hospital so it was literally the whole village (laughs) needed to help me and that was really tough because I've always been like on you know my my independence streak you know like I could do this I could do this (laughs) and so just just begging people for that help I was just like I felt so bad (laughs) I had a lot of there's so many protocols in the when you're in the hospital Um, And since I didn't have that transportation back and forth to the hospital every single day, I was admitted um, for the first 100 days of my transplant. And so I was in the hospital for a long time. And um, it was really rough because you would get, you can't sleep. (laughs) You know, there's Every six hours, there was something that somebody had to do. Every 12 hours, there was something somebody had to do. It was just, it was, it was intense. Um, But I had somebody visit me every day. Um, My best friend, she would come every day after work. So um, she would be there with me at the hospital every day. Sorry, I just... I love her so much. She like, she really got me through that. She came like the day of the transplant and she decorated my room. She she put photos everywhere. Um, I had a lot of people stop by that first day that I actually got my transplant to. Um, So it was nice. You know, like I always had visitors, um, but you know, like when they leave and you're there by yourself in the middle of the night, it's just... It's tough. There's, um, I think usually you just stay in the hospital because after your transplant, your um, white blood cell count basically goes to zero. Um, so your immune system has to build back up. And usually they will discharge people after your immune system has built back up. So just like getting that blood work every day and then hearing the numbers and you're just like, oh, I still have so long to go. Um, so it was, it was tough. Um, it, it was clear like very soon after um, that it hadn't been the, you know, the effect that they wanted. Um, after my first scan, post-transplant, they found that the cancer mis- metastasized to my bone, um, especially in my spine. Um, it was tough to hear, but I feel like what's really hard is getting other people's reactions to it, especially my parents um, and just like family members, just because we are also like, um, you know, my parents are refugees from Vietnam, so they don't, there's a language barrier, so they don't totally understand everything. And then there's just that constant thought in their head, like, you know, why is this happening? <laughs> um, so it's a lot of just trying to manage other people's emotions, really. Um, because for me, I just thought, you know, like, medicine in the U.S. is made for, you know, people's genetics who were born here, who are from here. Like, medicine was not built for people like me, who, where our genetics are, you know, across the world and things are different. Um, That's something that doctors haven't really realized that, you know, an Asian patient reacts differently to a lot of things than, you know, a Caucasian patient would. So um, I just felt that it was important for me to continue to, so that they could figure it out. You know, I don't want another young Asian girl to go through so much that she doesn't need to just because 
we have to be treated in facilities that weren't made for us. So it was obvious that we had to um, move to the next level, I guess, of stem cell transplants. So the first transplant I had was an autologous stem cell transplant because they were getting the stem cells from my own body. Um, the second transplant that I got was an allogeneic stem cell transplant, which um, gets stem cells from a donor. So that was the next step was to do the allo transplant with a donor. And that's the part that kind of scared me because I know I've worked with um, like Be The Match before. And I know I was part of like a, a big push for getting more um, diverse donors into the registry. Um, so it was a little scary because I knew that there weren't gonna be a lot of options for, for Asian people. Um, but, you know, once again, like my community came through and all my friends who are still at your, the university, they had a big Be The Match registry drive um, targeted uh, towards getting Asian people to sign up. So it was, I can't imagine being in that position where, you know, you're depending on somebody else to save your life, but there's, you know, there's people out there, but they're just not in this registry and you can't find them. Um, so that was a scary part of it. <laughs> and they, uh, to find a donor, they ask that, you know, any family members who want to come and, you know, see if there'll be a match for you, they can do that. So uh, my mom got tested and my sister got tested. And I wasn't really thinking that it would work out because just the way that I know genetics works, I only have one sister. So the chances that she would be a perfect match for me were not great. <laughs> Um, and then at best, my mom would only be a half match for me. So they could do half match transplants, but um, you know, the chances are of course gonna be better if you have a hundred percent match. Um, so luckily me and my sister are a hundred percent matches. <laughs> and we're a perfect match. So all my cells are yours tomorrow. And we're a perfect match. I remember getting the call when I was at work. So I usually like when I was at work, I would pick up my phone and I closed my office door immediately. People would get worried. <laughs> so um, I picked up the phone. It said Emery calling. So I just shut my door <laughs> and, and, and then I just like started screaming. They were like, your sister is a hundred percent match. And I was like, what? <laughs> I just started screaming. And after I got off the phone, I opened my office door and all my coworkers are standing there and they're like, what happened, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but luckily it was good news. So it was exciting. Um, yeah, and then I don't know if my sister already knew. So I called her too. And I was like, they just called me and told me that you're a hundred percent match. And so she was really excited too. So that was a huge relief because I really didn't think that she would be a perfect match. <laughs> but then people were like, you know, you and your sister, you're basically twins. <laughs> I didn't really have a good experience with my first transplant. Um, the clinic was just very full. The, it was just very rushed. If I had questions, I felt like I couldn't t ask anybody. Um, and it was just, it wasn't a good experience. So I didn't want to do a second transplant with them. Um, and I went to a different clinic to get a second opinion. And I went through my second transplant with them instead. So I think that was a big, um, that was a big change in my care um, that I'm really glad that I advocated for myself and was like, you know, this isn't working for me. I need to be somewhere else. Um, because my second transplant, um, it was kind of the same with the process. 
um, my sister had to fly in and she did all the stem cell collection. Um, while she was doing that, I was doing high dose chemotherapy um, still. And then I also had to do, um, I think it was like four sessions of total bottle. <laughs> I had to do four sessions of total body radiation um, before the transplant could start. Um, but I was also admitted to the hospital before my actual transplant started. So I, you know, that was kind of nice because I would just, you know, already be there. <laughs> I didn't have to be transported back and forth, being so tired from total body radiation all the time. So it was, it had different challenges than the first one, I think. Um, I think with my second transplant, since it was from a donor, that's when graft versus host disease came in. And um, my, like, my graft versus host was mainly in, like, my skin and some in my GI tract. Um, it affected my, my eyes a little bit. Um, so those were the worst side effects, like with the skin GVHD, it just gets like really red, itchy, flaky, and inflamed. And they give you this steroid cream and you're just like <laughs> piling tubs and tubs of steroid cream on your arms and legs and everything. And it was, it was everywhere, arms, legs, stomach, back, like, luckily it didn't get to my face. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then my eyes would get really dry. Um, so like even now, like like really bright sun or bright lights, my eyes are super sensitive now. Um, and then with the GI problems, it was just, it just, you know, like that's, that stomach ache feeling all the time. And I couldn't like eat anything really. Um, so it was just, it was, it was, it was tough to get through that. Eventually, I think once your body starts accepting the donor cells more, um, the, the symptoms kind of go down and, you know, you, they give you medication and stuff to manage it. So after that transplant, there was several medications that I had to be on for a few years afterwards, just to make sure that, you know, my body wouldn't reject the step, the donor cells as much. Um, but everything eventually just like calmed down with all of that. Um, so it was like a lot of maintenance treatments just with the medications and um, they've continued me on brentuximab. Um, I think that was kind of like their miracle drug at the time. Um, so they just kept me on that for maintenance and yeah, everything kind of cleared up. Um, I was warned that, you know, like when I, if I get sick or something like the GBHD symptoms might flare up sometimes, which I've seen like in this past year, like my skin has gotten really dry again, but luckily nothing as bad as it was before. Um, stem cell trans actually with all the um, prep for the second stem cell transplant, um, they actually have to get you into remission before they do the stem cell transplant. And so, um, which I feel like they should have done with my first transplant too, um, <laughs> which is also a reason I decided to go to another clinic. Um, but yeah, so with all the high dose chemotherapy and stuff, we did the scans and everything. And um, we found out I was in remission. And then that's when they scheduled me for my stem cell transplant. So it was, it was a little bittersweet because, you know, you get the news that you're in remission, but then you still have to plan for uh, another hundred days in the hospital. <laughs> um, so I've been in remission since uh, February of 2018. So it's been a little over five years, like five and a half years. Um, I think the most important thing that I learned was that there is no comparison with cancer. Um, every person is different. Every journey is different. 
even if you have the same exact diagnosis as somebody else, like you could be going through completely different things. And so, you know, there's, there's really, it's your own journey and you have to figure out a way to keep going um, no matter what, because it's yours. Like nobody else is going through it, but you. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of trying to make people understand a lot of managing emotions. Like I didn't realize that when I told people I had cancer, that I would have to comfort so many other people. <laughs> and it's, it's very eye-opening just to see who really cares about you, um, really tells you who's going to be um, a true friend. Um, it's, it's, cancer is the only thing that's like not going to lie to you. <laughs> it's going to tell you how it is with everybody. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's your, it's your own journey. Um, you can have bad days. I hated when people told me that I needed to stay positive and that, you know, like, yeah, some days you just want to curse the world and just be in your bed all day. Like take, take what you need, do what you need to do. Like nobody else knows what you're going through. So you just have to advocate for yourself. Let people know. Um, but I guess that's my thing. Like why I like to share my story is because people look at me and they say, you're young, you're healthy, um, but they don't know like all the, all of what it took to get there.